and before I dig into the verse by verse study today, I'm gonna to do something a little bit different, you know, change it up a little bit. I'm, I've gone through and I've combined the text of the other gospel accounts. This, the story we're gonna to read today, the information of the account is actually recorded in all four gospels. I believe it's the only uh, major account that is in all four gospels. And each, each gospel writer has a slightly different, um, you know, adds slightly different things to it. So I'm gonna, I put them all together. So um, I, I do wanna encourage you to later on review all these. They're in Matthew 14. It's in Mark 6, it's in Luke 9, and in John chapter 6. And uh, you know, dig those out. And again, we'll go verse by verse in a moment. But for right now, just sit back and listen to the full combined narrative uh, from all the gospel writers. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, by boat to a deserted place by himself. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all they had done. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there are many coming and going. And they didn't have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw them departing and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he had performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up to the mountain, went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. When he came out, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. He received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. Oh, excuse me, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Then Jesus lifted his eyes and seeing a great multitude toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, well, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, bring them here to me. Now there was much grass in the place, he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. So the men sat down in number about 5,000 besides women and children. When Jesus had taken the loaves, looking up into heaven, he blessed and had given thanks for them. He broke them and distributed them to his disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise the fish. He, he divided among them all as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, truly, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So what a great story, a lot of, lot of cool stuff in there. And uh, as we begin this, uh, we'll see uh, uh, that some time has passed since we've been in chapter five, not just a week. You know, we, sometimes we say, oh, it's been a week since we did this last one. Now this has been a long time. It may have been six months, a year, a couple of years. We really don't know. Sometimes it's easy to figure that out. Uh, you know, how, how the timeline's going, sometimes it's more difficult. And since all three of these 
gospel writers recorded the miracle, we know that there had been a lot of things going on in many, many areas of ministry during that time. Now, some things the other gospel writers record were that Jesus appointed the remainder of the 12 apostles who he would send out to preach the good news. He had healed a Roman centurion servant just by giving the word. Uh, today, uh, Then he was heading to a city called Nain. Now you can visit there today, just right off Highway 65 up there in, in north central Israel. As he was going, um, he passed a funeral possession right before he got into the city. And he took mercy on a widow who had lost her son. And he raised him from the dead right out of his coffin. He'd also brought a 12-year-old daughter back to life. And on the way to do that, a woman touched his clothes, hoping to be healed. And she was healed through her belief. A lot of neat things going on. The disciples actually learned that uh, when they were getting in a boat, going, going across the sea, that even the weather and the winds obeyed the voice of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, they, they saw him cast demons out of a lot of folks. John the baptizer had kind of faded in his ministry intentionally. He completed his, his work of preparing the way for the Lord. Um, he'd been killed by King Herod. And now King Herod was hearing about all these things that Jesus was doing. And Herod was sending for Jesus, you know, wondering, is this John the Baptist that came back to life again? Um, so Jesus, did, during this time, Jesus also did a lot of teaching about the kingdom of God. Uh, many of the parables that we read in the other gospels took place during this time. And you, you heard him teach those during this time. Uh, plus, he had taken a lot of extra time in explaining the parables and the, their deeper meanings to his, to his apostles and disciples and, and teaching them the ways of his father. So they were finally ready to preach the good news on his behalf. At the beginning of what I, I read here moments ago, he sent them out with specific instructions of how to go about their ministry. And that's where we see John picking up on the account of uh, when this happened. So now you can open your Bibles or your electronic devices and uh, to the Gospel of John, reading from the New King James Version, chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, Jesus at this point was still by himself. He went to rest, um, finally by himself. <laughs> you know, we, we know that Jesus went out many times to pray and commune with the Father. I believe this is one of those times. He'd been pouring his life out to so many people and, and training his disciples to follow him in ministry. And yes, his disciples were out ministering as they'd been told to do. They were getting ready to come back and they were excited about how God had been using them. And, um, you know, I could just see them all, you know, they, they probably said, meet me such and such a place, you know, when you come back at such and such a day. And they were all coming and they were telling the stories of what God had done through them. They were, they'd never done it themselves before this ministry thing. And, and so, uh, you know, they're probably talking nonstop about all this wonderful things and, and uh, just, for us today, our life lesson is there is fulfillment and joy in obeying the Lord and doing the work of the ministry. Just as the disciples found that day, 2,000 years or so ago, we can find today there is fulfillment and joy in obeying the Lord and doing the work of the ministry. Now, Jesus knew that at this point, they also needed a break and they needed to eat. Remember back at the, uh, the well at Sychar, the disciples went into town, bought food. You probably ate half of it on the way back and they saw Jesus, knew he was weary and said, no, you need to eat, you need to eat. Well, the tables have turned at this point in time. And so, uh, you know, we remember back in verse 31 and 32 of that chapter, it says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said to him, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Well, again, Tables were turned. Jesus was doing this to his disciples. He'd been renewed and rested. Uh, he was telling them to get some food because he, uh, he, he knew what was coming up. And so our another life lesson for us is we can gain strength by doing and finishing the work that the Lord sends us to do. The disciples were hungry. They didn't realize it because they had gained strength by doing and finishing 
the work that the Lord had sent them to do. Um, so do take the time when you're ministering. You know, don't forget, <laughs> don't wear yourself out completely. Uh, but it's, I guess it's better to wear yourself out than it is to rust out, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, don't just sit and let the, you know, let time pass and not do anything. So we're gonna continue in verse two, chapter six. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Now this is, this is a really difficult one to explain. Why did they follow him? Because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. Okay, that was an easy one. I, I like easy ones to explain. Verse three, and Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Uh, I, I kind of look at this as kind of a management team meeting. Um, they'd been apart for a while. They needed some time to get back together, to get settled, regroup, pray, prepare for the next phase of ministry. And uh, by the way, you, you we hear these words, it went up on the mountain and um, you know, near Bethsaida, these different things we hear. Um, we also hear in the news, this area where they were at was now, is now called the Golan Heights. So when you hear about the Golan Heights, you can just picture Jesus and his disciples having their, their management team meeting up there on the mountain. Verse four says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. And so this was just another and not just another, but this is one more thing to plan and carry out. That's getting everyone and their families prepared for the Passover. Now you'll remember that it's not just Jesus and 12 guys. Yes, they were with him where pretty much wherever he went, but there were also their families. There were other supporting people. We talked earlier about uh, a number of ladies that were a part of the ministry and followed them and, and supported them and brought food and, and money that they needed. And so um, they, they knew they would have to prepare for this. And it also lets us know that about there had been a good bit of time in the past since the events back in chapter two, just a few chapters ago, because it's a Passover again, <laughs> you know, it's at that time. So, and there, there may have been two Passover, another Passover in between there. We just don't know that because um, we don't have a date on each one of these things. But John records is the one that recorded the most Passovers in the gospel. Uh, he records three different Passovers um, and the other gospels only mention the one Passover. And that is the one around the time that Jesus was, being, uh, was to be crucified. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not as concerned with the, the Passover uh, and the meaning of Passover as, uh, as John was. I think John was more sensitive to that. He was sensitive to the Seder. Um, and, and the illustration that it showed that Jesus was the Lamb of God. You don't hear the other gospel writers talking about that, but, but John mentions that. In fact, he's the only one that mentions that. And we, you know, I, I, don't, I don't claim to even have a beginning of knowing why God does everything he does, but I, I kind of suspect that John's attention to the Passover and to, to knowing and understanding the Lamb of God and this, you know how that all worked out and, and Jesus' sacrifice for us, that it may have been one reason that God allowed him to live long enough to have the revelation where he, he wrote the book of Revelation from, from the vision that God gave him, uh, where he talks specifically about seeing the Lamb. He talks 25 times he mentions the lamb in the book of Revelation, where the other gospel writers never mention the lamb. Uh, in Peter, in the letter, First Peter, I believe, First Peter, he wrote something about the lamb of God one time in there. But um, you know, all the other disciples, all the other apostles died from being persecuted, died a martyr's death. John is the only one that we believe died a, a natural death but it wasn't the persecutor's fault, okay? Uh, it is said, we don't have a, a scriptural record, but in, in other records, it, it, it said that the Roman emperor commanded that the apostle John be boiled in oil in the Colosseum, you know, just because he wanted to, people to see him die. And John, in the pot of oil, that said that John continued to preach to the audience from the pot, <laughs> never heard him 
came out alive and they said that just about everybody that was in the Colosseum came to believe in Jesus Christ from John's preaching and the miracle of John not being harmed by that. And then they tried to poison him. They tried other ways and they could not kill this man. And so they ended up just sending him to Patmos. And that's where he received the vision, the revelation of Jesus Christ of what was to come in the future and things that we will we have seen in our lifetime and more things that are yet to come. Uh, maybe in our lifetime, maybe, maybe uh, soon afterwards. But we, we also know that once that emperor died, Jesus went back to Ephesus. He was kind of the church leader at Ephesus and he continued to serve the Lord. Now, John had been the youngest, he's probably 16 or 17 when he started to follow Jesus. He'd been the youngest apostle, but he also lived to be the oldest, dying in peace, probably somewhere in his 80s. And the accounts of all the, again, these, the accounts of his persecution were not recorded in the scripture, so we don't take them as pure gospel, so to speak. Uh, but it's clear that John had a long life serving Jesus, wrote uh, about five of the, uh, the books, uh, the, the account of John, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and the first, second, and third John in the letters section of the New Testament. So he escaped the martyr's death that way. So God had a lot of things for John. Our life lesson is no matter what the circumstances and no matter how old you are, God is not finished with you yet. So keep serving him. No matter what the circumstances and no matter how old you are, God is not finished with you yet. Keep serving him. So back in our text, verse five says, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now remember, Philip was the man from nearby Bethsaida, probably knew all the restaurants and all the you know, McDonald's and uh, uh, Outback Steakhouses that were in the area. And, uh, but Jesus had told him back in chapter one, he just simply said, follow me. And Philip pretty much dropped everything and started following Jesus. He'd also, Philip had also gone and got the cynical Nathaniel to follow Jesus back there and kind of had to push and prod him. Uh, so it's obvious Jesus, uh, Jesus' disciple Philip was a very devoted uh, follower, very anxious to do what the Lord wanted him to do. And we've read already from another gospel that Jesus had already told the disciples to give the crowd something to eat. You know, you give them something to eat. He didn't say go buy food for these people or tell them to go get themselves some food. But Matthew 14, 6 records, but Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. <laughs> you know, how many times uh, when the Lord has something for us to do that seems difficult um, with people, we just, instead of wanting to do the difficult thing or do something we don't understand what's going to happen, we just say, I wish they'd just go away. Or maybe we walk away from a situation that the Lord has kind of prompted us to go into. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but sometimes, unfortunately, uh, I think each of us can remember that we did not want to deal with the situation. And so we, we walked away. But the test that was mentioned here uh, is not a temptation. It's not a temptation to do wrong because God doesn't tempt people to sin. Nor was it Jesus really asking Philip because Jesus wanted to know, you know, he was testing Philip. Jesus wanted to know how Philip would respond. <laughs> he already knew how Philip would respond, but he wanted Philip and the others that were around him to know and remember how Philip would respond to this situation. So obviously the disciples were, had been together. They were trying to figure out in the flesh how they could possibly feed all these people. And Jesus knew that. You know, I, I kind of see Jesus um, going along with their thinking a little bit and, and you know, turning to Philip, probably with a grin on his face and saying, where shall we buy food that they can eat? You know, just knowing that with man, it wasn't going to be possible. So we're going to see what our life lesson here tells us. And that is when Jesus tells you to do the impossible, it's no longer the impossible. When Jesus tells you to do the impossible, it's no longer impossible. Now, Philip was one of the scholarly ones. He knew how the prophet had fed so many before with almost no food. Um, 
And, you know, look back and look at the ministry of Elisha and Elijah. You'll see these things happening. But in verse 7, we see Philip did not put all that knowledge and that wisdom of God's provision in the past to work on this one. Uh, he probably just was trying to use his human reasoning on this one and said, it says, verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that everyone of them may have a little. How many denarii do you have in your pocket? Okay, we don't use that today. <laughs> but it was a Roman coin. It really was another historical note. It's not, they don't make a big deal of in the scripture, but you know, the denarii was just something that they, they carried around in their pocket. Um, it was minted in different weights that it changed over time, uh, over 400 to 500 different years that it was used uh, from 200 some BC to over 200 AD. Well, in the time of Christ, during that time period, they say it weighed, they, the ones they found weighed about 3.9 grams of 98% pure silver. And of course, we find these things, you know, when they do archaeological digs and they have the, you know, the, the emperor's picture on them and their name. So we know who they were, and when, you know, when it happened. So we know that today, at today's value, market price of silver, each one of those denarii were worth about $3.21. Now, I want to point out here that it wasn't a failure. I don't think it was really a failure on, on Philip's part not to understand where Jesus was going with his question. Um, you know, sure, we can look back now and say, you know, Jesus healed people with his words. He raised the dead by stopping their coffins. Um, he even stopped a terrible storm just by saying, you know, telling the wind and waves to stop. Surely Philip should have known that what Jesus could have done. Well, that's not the point. Jesus had told all the disciples to feed the crowd. And I just think when they couldn't figure out what to do, they knew they didn't have food. They looked around the crowd. There was almost nothing there the crowd had brought because they weren't planning to, to eat. They were planning to listen to Jesus. Uh, I, I figured they probably just started counting up the money between the, what they had between themselves, the money in the treasury. They came up with 200 denarii between them all and knew that that wouldn't even get all the people biscuits at McDonald's, you know, much less a supersized combo. So today, again, math is, is easy. Philip was pretty good at math. That much money, 200 denarii, would have been worth $642 in today's dollars. So they were pretty good at math. If we take bread, at the average $1.55 a pound it was last month, we get about 414 pounds of bread. Well, what are you talking about? Well, slice that up, get about 12 slices per pound, that's almost 5,000 slices. One slice per man and all the kids and women go hungry, right? No, no. <laughs> Probably twice that many people there all together, maybe more. So Philip was right. They couldn't buy enough food for everyone even to get a slice of bread. Um, not even, probably not even half a slice. So God's idea of something to eat is not half a slice of bread, <laughs> okay? The disciples were now scrounging around trying to find something and suddenly there's food to be found. We see in verse eight, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? <laughs> Great observation, guys. The disciples were thinking half a slice of bread and they found a little kid who had packed himself a decent lunch for a kid. Now the barley loaves weren't like we think of a, a loaf of wheat bread. They were little, like a, they, they were, uh, poor people had them at that time uh, because they were barley. If they were wheat, wheat cost about three times as much. And so they didn't have so much wheat um, if they were poor. So they had like, like a little pita, a little flat round cake. And that's called a loaf. Now they, they weren't a luxury loaf like we would have today with a, a real wheat sandwich. Uh, also, the, the little fish they had were probably salted fish to preserve them. And um, they probably ate them together with it, probably one of the first sandwiches, even though sandwiches weren't supposed to be invented officially until the 1800s. Um, you know, this, this kid had a sandwich with him, fish sandwich. So, um, you know, it, it would have been, his lunch would have been a, akin to maybe a Chick-fil-A or a quarter pounder or something. Uh, enough to stave off hunger for a while, but not a big meal. So uh, th there's one other thing with the five barley loaves and two small fish. Um, as I was studying and I, I 
You know, after I, I studied out, I also looked to see, you know, what are other people thinking about? You know, what are some of their thoughts? And I found people were trying to put all kinds of meanings, significance to the number of loaves and that they were barley and the two fish. And, and you know, I just think that that's what the kid had in his bag. And it wasn't anything special or significant or, or deeper meanings. Um, some people draw parallels to back when Elijah asked for a handful of bread from the, the widow. Um, but it lasted, that handful lasted until the famine was over. Or it could have been that Jesus was showing a greater power than those of the great prophet Elisha. In 2 Kings 4, Elisha took 20 of these little pita loaves of barley that were offered to him and fed it to 100 men. Obviously, they were multiplied in the process. Uh, and then they, they had leftovers too. So they, were, they say that Jesus was doing some serious one-upmanship. <laughs> Instead of feeding 100 with 20 loaves, he fed 5,000 in women and children with only five loaves and had more left over. Others say that the five loaves represented the five books of Moses, you know, the Torah. Others focus on the fact that it was close to Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which celebrates the, uh, you know, kind of celebratory of the, the barley harvest, connecting that bread with the communion and Jesus' sacrifice. Then some equate the 12 baskets that were picked up, uh, left over to symbolize the, symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 patriarchs or the 12 apostles. Um, and the only reason I mention these things is that you might come across someone that's reading these things into the numbers. Um, personally, I looked a lot. None of these analogies really apply when you, when you go across the entire spectrum. And so I'll just accept it on face value. The kid had five loaves, two fish, and uh, said, yeah, okay, I'll give them if, if, you, if the master needs them. So verse 10, Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now again, 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Also, that's a pretty good sized crowd. <laughs> you know, I've, I've never spoken to a crowd of 5,000. <laughs> Five, maybe not 500, I'm not sure. Um, but he had them, had them sit down. They'd been likely standing listening to Jesus, teaching for hours, watching him do the miracles, probably wanting to hear more and more from the Messiah they had discovered. Um, they're probably trying to get closer to see what was gonna happen next. I can imagine that he would, he would teach for a while and then someone would, would finally make their way through the crowd and bring someone that was sick or lame or, <clears throat> or blind and Jesus would touch them and heal them. They wanted to see what was happening. So there was a, a constant press of the crowd, but Jesus knew what was gonna happen next. He wasn't panicking. He wanted everybody to calm down. Everyone needed to relax and needed to do things in an organized way. So he gave the order to his disciples to make the people sit down. Now you've probably noticed, we've uh, turned another corner in the ministry here since the last chapter. Jesus had trained did you notice that? Jesus had trained and equipped his men to do the work of the ministry, and they were picking it up. They were doing it. He'd recently sent them out to minister without him, and he expected people to respond, and sure enough, people responded the same way as they did with him. They took up the responsibility, did as he told them, and people responded, and now it's continuing. The disciples passed along Jesus' message through the crowd, and people responded. They knew that the disciples' authority came from Jesus. Guess what? We have a life lesson for us today. When we speak God's word to people with the authority of Jesus, people will respond. When we speak God's word with the authority of Jesus, people will respond. Again, Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he hadn't told the crowd. He hadn't even told the disciples. <laughs> He just told them to feed the people. And now they have almost no food. They finally calmed down, made the crowd sit down at just the right time. And we read in verse 11, and Jesus took the, the loaves and Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. <laughs> wow, we, we, we see from the other scriptures that Jesus had uh, bless the food. You notice he didn't feed the people. 
You know, if you look in your, you know, a lot of the Bibles, you'll see little topics, little headings. Uh, I, I, I look at those, but I, I tend to ignore them because it's not, they, they're not always accurate. You might look in yours and it might say, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Who fed the 5,000 plus women and children? The disciples fed them, <laughs> right? I mean, he, Jesus could have just made the food appear in everybody's hand if he wanted to. But he let his disciples have the blessing of carrying it out, you know, feeding the people. And notice that John writes that they gave the food to those who had, bade them, who had obeyed the master, those who were sitting down. Not eating half a slice of bread, as was man's plan, but they ate all the loaves of bread they want. They ate all the fish they wanted to eat. And there was plenty to spare. Um, <laughs> I, I don't eat just raw fish or salted fish as a whole, but I've seen some guys, and especially in other countries, man, they'll, they'll, they'll take a big fish and they'll just eat the whole thing. I pull the bone out. Anyway, that's what they, that they're used to that. So praise God. God had provided abundantly for their needs. Plenty to spare. So in verse 12, it says, so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remained so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, you notice there weren't fish left over. Why? I'm just guessing that fish would eventually go bad if they stored them in these baskets, but the barley loaves were not, so they had food. Jesus demonstrated a couple of really important characteristics of our loving Heavenly Father here. And the first one is he is very generous, providing over and above what our needs are. And the second is that he is never wasteful and he wants us to make good use of everything. To be good stewards of our resources, where there are things that we may have worked ourselves to get, you know, through his strength and power, or from the abundance of things that have been freely given to us without cost or obligation. And, and also, I, I think it's kind of funny um, the way John writes this, putting it together. He, f he says, they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves. Obviously, the five loaves would not have even filled one basket. But I think it's the emphasis on the amazing miracle done, uh, the way John said. It's like saying, we filled up the whole pantry with leftovers from this little can of beans that we had to start with. <laughs> you know, So uh, it just showing the amazing thing, a miracle that God had done and something else that we might miss in our society um, that, uh, you know, we have an abundance many times. Uh, we are, th there are many others in our, our world that do not have that abundance. There are many others that are in the same situation as the crowd around him was in that time. And remember, remember that Jesus taught his disciples to pray and included the words, Give us this day our daily bread. Why? I mean, do you pray every day? Lord, give me, give me the food I need to eat today. Well, probably you already know when you wake up in the morning, you probably know what you're going to go out and get to eat. Well, life was a struggle. They didn't have a pantry of food. Uh, back then, you didn't have credit cards or food stamps or, or an overabundance. A not so good day is a day that you were not able to gather or grow or beg for enough food to feed the family that day. A normal day was when you went out and things went well, or a good day, it's when you went out, things went well, you worked, you got enough food for you and your family to eat that day. It might be a struggle, but you got food. That's why Jesus taught them to pray by asking God to help to get the food for that day. And if you didn't have to worry about your next meal, you know, you were, you were well off. And if you'd had food stored up, where you had maybe a week or more than that ahead, maybe you know, even beyond that, days and days of food available to you, you were a rich person, okay? And there weren't many people like that. That's why the only bread they had was barley bread. The well-off people had the wheat bread, which was much more expensive. Again, harder to keep, harder to get. But that was the miraculous sign that Jesus performed. As we learned last week from Jesus in the earlier teaching, he said, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. These thousands of people 
just had seen for themselves the witness that Jesus had spoken of, the works his father gave him to do that bore witness of who he was and, and of him as God. The response of the people that heard these words of God through the day, um, through the witness of the works, is by now what you would expect of someone seeking the truth. Uh, unlike some of the religious leaders we saw in the last chapter that were wanting to kill him for doing the works of the Father, it says in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So that's where we conclude, but also that's our, our tie to the next teaching next time. We'll pick it up as we see this response and more response to this sign. But for now, what is your response to Jesus? Do you believe in him, rely on him, fully trust in him? And I hope so. I hope you do. And as we finish up, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you again for being with us. And go in peace and walk with God.